Good morning, I'm Nancy Stansfield and I thank you very much for attending this lecture today. I am the Assistant Director of the Institutional Review Board at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I am going to be speaking to you today um, about the IRB process. The first thing we're going to talk about is why we have an Institutional Review Board. Uh, you've, you've attended previous lectures that spoke about the uh, Belmont Report. The Belmont Report sets, sets forth three basic ethical principles for the conduct of research. These are respect for per persons, beneficence, and justice. All international and U.S. research that is covered by federal wide assurance must uh, ascertain that, that they comply to the Belmont Report. There are also federal regulations that require certain institutional responsibilities, uh, and these would be to review and, and approve human subjects research to ensure that the rights and the welfare of the participants are protected. There are also university and institutional policies that must be um, abided by. There are federal, state, and local regulations on the human subjects, use of human subjects in research also. The UAB IRB office has a staff of approximately 25 individuals. We have support staff. We have uh, one director, one associate director, and four assistant directors. We have protocol ana analysis, analysts, I'm sorry, um, and numerous other uh, administrative personnel. We have a board meeting on a weekly basis. These are every Wednesday morning. These are held from 9 until approximately uh, 12 or 1 o'clock every Wednesday, unless it's a holiday, of course. Uh, federal regulations require that the IRB membership be composed of faculty representatives and unaffiliated members with various backgrounds. We always have a minimum of five members present including one scientist, one non-scientist, and one who is otherwise not affiliated with UAB. We have community members who also um, participate as board members here at UAB. And of course, um, all re IRB approval must be obtained prior to the initiation of any research procedures involving human subjects. So let's talk about you now when must the IRB review your research. There are several different times that are required by the federal regulations as far as when IRB review must occur. The first of these is initial. The initial uh, application is always submitted to the IRB prior to re any recruiting or enrolling human subjects. So as all of you know, uh, we have lots of forms at our website that you're required to complete based on uh, what risks are involved um, in the research, what vulnerable populations are involved in the research, and whether you're obtaining consent, where you're requesting a waiver of informed consent, whether you're requesting a waiver of authorization. The next time that your uh, research is reviewed would be at a continuing review. Based on the risk involved in your research uh, determines how often we review your research. The regs require that all research are reviewed at least annually. More often we see research that is of higher risk, such as maybe stem cells or some sort of um, device that will re be reviewed on a biannual or even a quarterly basis. It, again, it depends on the risk of your research. You would also submit an amendment prior to initiating any changes to any approved research. So for instance, if you are adding personnel, if you are changing any of your research procedures, maybe you're adding another site, you would submit a protocol revision amendment form. Uh, and that form is found at our website for, it, for approval of any change in any ongoing research. And then, of course, at the end of the study, when you close the study, you'll be submitting a final report to the uh, IRB. And the uh, continuing review and the final report are submitted via an investigator's progress report. These forms are all found at the IRB website online. 
Unfortunately, um, we are not electronic yet. However, that is coming. So we look forward to electronic submissions, hopefully within the next year. And the last time that um, we would review your research, and we hopefully don't like um, to see these too often, is problems. If we have um, complaints from research participants, uh, your research will be reviewed. As you know, your consent document contains um, the, the telephone number of the IRB office, and we do keep a log of complaints. We follow up on complaints. Um, Serious adverse events are always reviewed by the IRB office, and also issues of noncompliance. Noncompliance would be considered um, things such as um, continuing lapse in approvals. It will be not following um, uh, the, the protocol. So we don't like to see noncompliance. So by all means, um, make sure that you are complying with the rules and regulations and IRB policies at UAB. Let's talk next about what is human subjects research. How do you know when you should apply uh, for, re for approval of your research? According to the federal regulations, research is defined as a systematic investigation designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge. So there are two components here. One, your research or your application has to be um, a systematic investigation, and this is your protocol. These are your research procedures. These are your interve interventions. And then secondly, it has to be designed to contribute to generalizable knowledge. Oftentimes, we receive applications, and they're actually quality improvement or quality initiative procedures for uh, research. For instance, um, just this week I reviewed an application that was happening um, actually at another state at another institution, and they were implementing a program that was specific to their hospital, specific to their institution. So the findings from this research really could not be generalizable to other hospitals simply because what they were doing is so specific to their institution. Human subjects research always involves obtaining information about living individuals through intervention or interaction with these individuals. Human research also involves obtaining identifiable private data about any individual. So let's talk about intervention, interaction, and private information. Intervention includes both physical procedures for data gathering. These examples of these would be uh, such as the venipuncture and EEG recording and manipulation of the subject or the subject's environment that are performed for research purposes. Uh, interaction could include communication through maybe a, a focus group through an interview or any type of interpersonal contact between the investigator and the subject. Private information would be information that uh, about a behavior that occurs in a context in which an individual can reasonably expect that no observation or recording has taken place. For instance, if you're observing at the park, uh, maybe you're observing um, uh, children playing on the playground, maybe you're observing uh, how couples interact. This would be private information because the, they would not assume that anyone is, is watching or observing their behaviors. Other type of private information includes um, information that's been provided for specific purposes by an individual and which the individual can reasonably expect that will not be made public. For example, their school records, uh, their ACT scores, their SAT scores, their medical records. This is all private information that one would assume would not be made public. So anytime you are interacting uh, with human subjects for research, anytime you are providing any sort of study interventions for human subject research, or you are obtaining private information um, about an individual, the individuals become research participants uh, in your study. So let's talk a little bit about private information. What makes 
information private? For instance, what in the medical record makes this medical record private? As you all know, there's something called uh, HIPAA. There are 18 HIPAA identifiers, and these should be tattooed on your heart. The list of HIPAA identifiers um, are listed here. Names, all geographic subdivisions smaller than a state. This would include uh, zip codes. You can collect the first three digits of the zip code, but not the last two, because the last two uh, is considered an address. Uh, any geocodes, all elements of dates except the year. So if you're collecting the date of service, such as the date of surgery, the date of a specific procedure, this would be considered a HIP identifier. Other dates would be, of course, date of birth, admission date, discharge date, etc. Telephone numbers, fax numbers, email addresses, social security numbers, medical record numbers, health plan beneficiary numbers, any type of account numbers such as a lab session number, um, certificates or license numbers such as the driver's license, vehicle identifiers, device identifiers such as maybe you have a um, particular pacemaker, then that device identifier would be a HIPAA identifier. Any URLs, any IP addresses, biometric identifiers would be like um, voice prints or fingerprints, and some of the ocular scans are considered biometric identifiers. And then, of course, if you were audio uh, and video taping an individual, their full face, face photographic images and any comparable images would also be a HIPAA identifier. And then if there's any unique code that you've assigned to this individual. So, for instance, if their subject number is UAB001, if there's a link to that, then that is a HIPAA identifier. Now, also keep in mind when, when you talk about the HIPAA identifiers, these 18 identifiers must be associated with the condition, treatment, or diagnosis in order to be considered a HIPAA identifier. So, for instance, if you are emailing someone and you are emailing them from um, the pulmonary hypertension clinic, even the, though the, you haven't said that uh, your appointment is with the pulmonary hypertension clinic, but your name has Susie Smith, research nurse, pulmonary, hyper, pulmonary hypertension department, then one would assume that that individual who you are emailing um, has pulmonary hypertension. So you've immediately associated their email address uh, to their diagnosis. So this would become a HIP identifier. Many times we receive applications at the IRB, and even though these 18 direct identifiers are not on the uh, demographic collection sheet, there are many indirect identifiers, such as ethnic group, sex, uh, religion, uh, occupation, where these can be drilled back to make a subject's responses identifiable. For instance, if you were, um, if you were doing a survey of nurses uh, in a particular unit, and pre and you're collecting the indirect identifiers of maybe age, ethnic group, religion. Um, then, if there's only one Asian nurse who is 50 years old. Uh, who may be Buddhist, then you automatically know who that person is. Even though their name is not on their survey, they are identifiable based on the indirect identifiers that you're collecting. So uh, no combination of information recorded uh, should, could be, uh, if it is, if you're collecting indirect identifiers, make certain that if you tell the participant that their information is anonymous, then make sure that those indirect identifiers do not, uh, in, um, they do not identify that individual. Now, now that we know what, it, what is research, um, research being the systematic investigation designed to contribute to generalizable knowledge, and we know what a human subject is, someone that you're interacting with, intervening with, or obtaining identifiable private data, um, then you need to know what level of IRB review will your protocol re be reviewed at, okay? At the IRB, we have four levels of review. 
Okay, and the, in general, the type of review required is based on the potential for risk of harm or discomfort and or involvement of any vulnerable groups in the research. Okay, there are four levels of review at the IRB, and these are all based on risk, the risk to the individual. The lowest level of review is not human subjects research. There is basically no risk to this whatsoever. In our office of the IRB, um, one person re reviews these, or maybe two. So these do not go to the full board. These are simply very low risk. Uh, there, there is no way that, it, that any human subject could be uh, identified or any human subject could be harmed from a not human subjects research application. For exempt, um, this is our second level of review. For exempt research, um, we normally have two to three people reviewing this research. And again, this would be very minimal risk, practically no risk whatsoever. Excuse me. Can I start over? Thank you very much for having me today. I am Nancy Stansfield. I am the assistant director, one of the four assistant directors of the UAB IRB at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. I am here to talk to you today uh, about the IRB process, uh, hopefully to give you some guidance and insight into how we review and why we review what we do at the IRB at UAB. Thank you for having me. Let's first talk about why we have an Institutional Review Board. There have been previous lectures on the Belmont Report. The Belmont Report sets, sets forth three basic ethical principles for the conduct of research involving human subjects. These are respect for persons, beneficence, and justice. There are also federal regulations that must be adhered to that require an Institutional Review Board to review and approve human subjects research to ensure that the rights and the welfare of the participants will be protected. 
And then also there are university policies and procedures. There are state and local policies, procedures, and laws that must be adhered to also um, when you're conducting human subjects research. At the UAB IRB, we have a large staff of about 25 individuals. We have a direct, one director, one associate director, and we have four assistant directors. There are um, four protocol analysts and numerous support staff at the IRB. Um, the convened meeting meets every Wednesday unless it is a holiday. Uh, we meet from 9.30 in the morning until we finish. So hopefully we are finished by noon to 1 o'clock, but there's sometimes that we aren't finished until uh, maybe 2 or 3 o'clock, but that isn't too often. So um, we are very fortunate to hear we have two boards. We also have a third board, which is WERB. Uh, all of our industry studies at UAB do go to WERB and are reviewed by WERB. In, uh, in many investigator-initiated studies will stay at UAB, um, and then other studies are reviewed by either Board 1 or Board 2 at the UAB IRB. The UAB's um, IRB membership is composed of faculty representatives, also unaffiliated members with various backgrounds. The Federal regulations require that there must be a minimum of five members on the board at each convened meeting. Uh, this, this one must include a, one member must be a scientist, one must be a non-scientist, and one individual must be a community member who is not affiliated with UAB and who is familiar with the local uh, community norms and values. And as we all know, uh, IRB approval must occur prior to initiation of any research procedures involving human subjects. So there, there are actually five times when the IRB will review your protocol. Uh, first of all is the initial review. We have a new process at the IRB where we are having a pre-review. So once we receive, receive an application, we have one of our protocol analysts or senior staff review your application to make certain that um, we have that the board will have everything they need to provide, hopefully, a rapid approval. So once your application goes through the pre-review process and you've provided all the documents that have been requested, your application will be sent for initial review by, um, uh, by the board. Or if it's expedited, no humans are exempt, it will be reviewed by the vice chair and approved by the vice chair. So the initial review must occur prior to recruiting or enrolling subjects. The federal regulations require that continuing review occur at least on a yearly basis. Now, we do have some higher risk studies here at UAB that are reviewed on a biannual basis or even a quarterly basis. So depending on the risk of your study depends on how often the IRB requests that we review your project. Most of ours are on an annual review, especially the expedited. Uh, those are all annual, uh, reviewed annually. But many of our full board protocols that are of higher risk are reviewed on a biannual or quarterly base, basis. But the regs do require that all research is reviewed at least annually. And prior to initiating any changes to any approved research, you should submit an amendment. So the third time that our reason for reviewing a research project would be if your research changes. For instance, if you add personnel, if you remove personnel, if there are revisions or amendments to your protocol, then these need to be reported to the IRB. If there are changes to your consent document, these need to be sent to the IRB via the protocol revision amendment form, and that form is also found at our website. And then, of course, at the close of the study, we also ask for a final report. The final report is submitted through the investigator's progress report. Um, and also the continuing review is submitted through the investigator's progress report. So you would complete the final report once your study has been closed, if it, your study is sponsored uh, it, by an industry, um, by industry, then you would attach your closeout letter from uh, your, your monitor um, or the sponsor. And then, of course, the times that we don't like to review are when there are problems. Uh, we 
received many uh, phone calls at the IRB from uh, research participants, and as you know, the consent document has a section in the questions section that specifically tells who they should, who the research participants should contact in the event they have questions. Of course, the investigator is listed, but there's also a section that includes the uh, UAB telephone number, and trust me, they use it. So we do keep a log of uh, any complaints that we receive, and this is strictly for our accreditation. Uh, we look for trends. Is, is it just one study? Is it just one PI? Is it just one coordinator? Why are they calling? So if there are trends, then we will certainly um, follow up on that also. But we follow up on every phone call um, and keep a log and document the follow-up um, at, at those times that we receive uh, complaints from a research participant. Of course, if there are serious adverse events, we need to know about those immediately. There's a problem reporting sheet found at the uh, IRB website on our forms page, and that will tell you when and what problems should be reported immediately as SAEs. And then, of course, is there, if there's any noncompliance, then um, we actually have a noncompliance office at the IRB. and. If we think there's noncompliance or someone reports noncompliance, if your monitor uh, indicates that there may be noncompliance or issues, then it may warrant a visit from the compliance officer at the IRB. So now that you know what we review, I'm sure there are many times when you ask, do I need to submit this project? So the questions that you need to ask are, is this research? Research, quality assurance, QI, uh, quality improvement, there's a fine line there. So we receive many calls at the IRB, <clears throat> do I need to submit this as research? <clears throat> so according to the federal regulations, the first thing that we always ask is, is does this project meet the federal um, regulation definition of research? According to the federal regulations, research is defined as a systematic investigation designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge. <clears throat> so the first component of research, is your project a systematic investigation? Meaning if this is a multi-center project, are all research procedures being done exactly the same way at every institution? If you have numerous participants, uh, are all research procedures being carried out in the same manner with every research participant. As a side note, if you um, at the IRB, we have a policy that if you only have three research participants, uh, three or less, we don't consider that research because it's strictly a case report because you really can't obtain a lot of good data just from three research participants. So, um, <clears throat> so. The first component of your project that you should ask, uh, is this a systematic investigation? Uh, if you can answer yes to that, then one component of the definition of research is satisf satisfied. The second component of the regulatory definition of research is that it must be designed to develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge. This means that the findings from your research must be generalizable or generalized or be able to be generalized to other institutions. For instance, I had a, a study just this week where um, a, a PhD nursing student was doing a project in uh, his hospital, but it was so specific to his hospital that the information that they were obtaining from this study could not be generalized and useful to other institutions. So this project was deemed as not research. Um, so even it was really deemed as a, more of a quality initiative rather than being not uh, research, rather than being research. So again, there's a fine line there, and any time that you are questioning whether you should submit a project to the IRB, ask yourself the first question, is this research? Is it a systematic investigation designed to contribute to generalizable knowledge? Um, and both of these components 
of the regulatory definition of research must be met. Now, the second component, uh, once you have defined or determined if your project is research rather than QI or QA, then is it human subjects research? A lot of times we see projects here where they're obtaining data about an institution, uh, maybe another hospital. How many patients did um, you admit last year? Do you have policies about admission procedures? Do you have um, a discharge a discharge planner? So these would be institutional level, an institutional level questionnaire. It would not um, particularly be human subjects research, because human subjects research involves obtaining information about living individuals or th uh, through interaction or intervention with inter individuals. A human subject is a living individual from or about whom an investigator conducting research obtains data through intervention or interaction, or it could be identifiable private data. So even though you are not interacting or intervening with a research participant, if you're obtaining identifiable private data from their medical record, then yes, um, they are a human subject in your research. Let's talk about what is intervention, interaction, and private information. As you know, intervention um, could include both physical procedures um, and manipulation of the subject or the subject's environment for research purposes. So for instance, if you dim the lights in this room, you are manipulating the environment um, and you could be manipulating the environment um, in a research procedure or project. If you control the temperature in the room, then that would be manipulating the environment. Physical procedures would include venipunctures, EKGs, the chest x-rays, um, any type of intervention that you are performing on an individual um, for data gathering should be recorded and also um, Okay. Hey. Good. Thank you. Um, interaction with a research individual includes communication or interpersonal contact between the investigator and the subject. For instance, if you are uh, administering a survey, this would be interaction. Even though you have mailed the survey to the participant, even though you have um, mailed the letter, maybe you've not. A, a information sheet, a consent form, maybe you haven't spoken to the individual, but still you're interacting through your uh, information sheet, your cover letter, um, and you're asking them to complete the survey. Private information includes information about behavior that occurs in a context in which an individual can reasonably expect that no observation or recording is taking place. For instance, if you're observing children in a park, if you're observing uh, students in a classroom, the students and the children would expect that uh, no one is observing their behavior. But, it, but this would also be considered um, um, a research intervention. Private information could include information that has been provided for specific purposes by an individual and in which the individual can expect that uh, these results will not be made public. For instance, their school records, their SAT scores, their uh, MCAT scores, um, their ACT scores, SAT scores, and also the medical records. So for instance, um, if you're obtaining private information from a medical record, this would be human subjects research because that individual, that information was obtained in a fashion uh, in which the individual expected that it would remain private. So any time that you are interacting, intervening with a research participant, and, or you're obtaining private information, then it does become human subjects research. Now, let's talk about what makes information private. There, um, there's something called HIPAA, which I'm sure everybody's aware of and knows about. And there is a, um, there are 18 
HIP identifiers. So anytime any of these 18 HIP identifiers are associated with a condition, treatment, or diagnosis, then it becomes PHI, protected health information. So for instance, if you are emailing a research participant and you have in your uh, name tag that you are Susie Smith from the Pulmonary Hypertension Clinic, then that is automatically uh, an assumption, should there be a breach in confidentiality, that the participant uh, who you're emailing has pulmonary hypertension. So you have um, attached their diagnosis to their email address, so that becomes a uh, PHI and it is a breach in confidentiality. So any of these 18 uh, HIP identifiers when associated with a treatment condition or diagnosis is considered PHI and it should be protected. Uh, the 18 HIP identifiers include the names, it includes the address, uh, zip codes. You can collect the first three um, numbers of the zip code but not the last two. Uh, all elements of dates, uh, telephone numbers, fax numbers, email addresses, social security numbers, medical record numbers, health plan beneficiary numbers, account numbers, certificate license numbers, vehicle identifiers, um, URLs, IP addresses, biometric identifiers, which include things such as voice prints, fingerprints, uh, ocular scans. Uh, full face photographic images are also uh, one of the HIP identifiers. So for instance, if you are videoing your research participants as they um, maybe walk in your special shoe that you've invented, then um, uh, that their full facial features or their images would be a, a HIP identifier. Now, uh, there's also, um, these are the direct identifiers. They're also indirect identifiers. We see applications in the, res in the IRB frequently where the, um, p the PI tells us, oh, this is all anonymous data. And then you look at their demographic sheet and the information they're collecting are indirect identifiers such as ethnic groups, such as sex, age, religion, income. Um, if you're doing a study, it is so easy to drill back these indirect identifiers, especially if you have a small population. In this instance, for instance, you are um, you're, some, you're giving a survey to the nurses on a, on a particular unit as part of your research. Well, you have these demographic sheets where you're collecting their ethnic group, their, um, their age, their sex. You've probably already been able to identify many of those. If you only have one Asian, um, one Hispanic on that nursing unit, then automatically they're identifiable. So be very careful about what you ask in your demographics to make certain that if you are truly com completing an anonymous survey that you're not collecting a combination of indirect identifiers that would make you, the responses identifiable. Now, once you've determined that you do have to submit um, uh, an IRB application, the next question you ask is what level of review, which application should I submit? At the IRB, there are four levels of review and three applications. Um, based on the risk involved in your study would determine the level of review uh, that the project would be reviewed at. Um, for instance, not human subjects research. There is no risk whatsoever involved. This is totally de-identified data uh, or specimens. Uh, it could be cell lines. So uh, we ha if it's a non-human subjects research application, uh, you would submit the application from the website that's called non-human subjects research. And we would have one or two people at the office look at that. That would never go to the board simply because there is no risk whatsoever involved. The next uh, level of risk would be an exempt application. Uh, we'll go over these in a bit, but the federal guidelines have listed um, six categories of minimal risk um, 
research that can be conducted through the exempt process. And basically, there, again, there's no risk to this whatsoever. And this would be reviewed by probably two people um, in our office. There, the, the next highest level of review is the expedited application. Uh, by the way, there is an exempt application at our website. Uh, the expedited application would be Form 200. There are seven categories, and expedited is reviewed by usually a protocol analyst or a senior staff, and then it goes to our vice chair uh, for approval. So again, the expedited does not go to the full convened board. And again, the expedited has to be minimal risk. And of course, the highest risk um, protocols do go to a full or convened board. Now, let's talk about risks that we look at. You may be doing a study and, and, and you, you, know, you think, oh, there are no risks to this whatsoever. But there are many kinds of risk. It's not just fiscal risk. I mean, fiscal risk are the easiest. Of course, if you harm somebody physically, that's really easy to determine. Or if there is a potential for, potential, potential for fiscal harm, that's easy to determine. In research ethics, risk is defined as the magnitude of the potential harm or discovery comfort and the probability of the harm or discomfort occurring. Of course, there are fiscal risks. There are also psychological risks. Uh, for instance, we had a study recently where uh, the investigator was interviewing um, women who had had an abortion. Could there be psychological risk from um, recounting their abortion? Okay. Uh, there's social risk. Could this study place this person at harm for their uh, harm of their reputation? Could it be stigmatizing to them? Their economic risk. Could information that you gather in your study place the individual maybe at risk of losing their job or risk of future employability? Uh, their legal risk. Could information that you obtain in your study incriminate them if you're asking them about uh, illegal behaviors. If there were breach in confidentiality, could this place this? In, could your study place this individual um, at a legal risk? Their dignitary risk. If the research participants are elected officials, uh, could anything in your study place them at risk of losing their appointed or elected position? And then, of course, there there's something called the relational risk. Patients value their doctor-patient relationships. So could information that you obtain in your study um, put that patient at a risk for loss of that relational uh, relationship with, with their physician? OK, let's talk about the uh, lowest level of risk that uh, any study would have at this university, and that would be non-human subjects research. Of course, this is uh, cadaveric materials or data. Um, any, again, human subjects research is about living individuals. So if you're using cadaveric materials or data, this is not human subjects research. Now again, though, keep in mind that UAB, the UAB IRB is also um, a privacy board. So HIPAA kicks in even though the inv individuals may be deceased. So just because you're doing a research uh, project that maybe you're doing a medical record review on um, deceased individuals, we still need to see that and approve that because we are also a privacy board and HIPAA kicks in. Uh, commercially available cell lines uh, would be non-human subjects research. Coded or de-identified specimens obtained from a non-commercial source. So for instance, if you are um, obtaining de-identified samples from another institution, another investigator at another institution, or even an investigator here at UAB, if those are totally de-identified or coded and you enter into an agreement with the individual who uh, knows the identity and holds the key to that code, that you will never ask for that um, identifying information or that key and you won't try to uh, re-identify these individuals, then it can be non-human subjects research. But we will ask you for that document where 
maybe Dr. S Dr. Grissel here has said that he will never provide you with any information that um, would allow you to re-identify um, the source of that specimen or data. Publicly available data sets uh, are non-human subjects research. We actually have a new form at the IRB, and it's on our website. So if you have a, uh, if you use any sort of public data set and you would like to nominate that for a data set that can be used without IRB approval, um, then please do because there are uh, some data sets that can be used that that we know that they, it's totally benign, that there is no way that that can be uh, identifiable and you can go ahead and use those without even applying uh, to the IRB. Um, and then, of course, any sort of secondary data analyses, and we see this often. Uh, for instance, a lot of students want to reanalyze data from maybe uh, their mentor or their faculty advisor. So in this instance, uh, the PI or the owner of the source data cannot be listed as the COI on the application simply because they know the identity of these individuals. So they cannot be a co-investigator. If you're a student who is doing a secondary data analysis and your mentor, your faculty advisor is providing you with uh, uh, de identified data, please don't list your faculty advisor or the individual who knows the identity of the source of this data um, on your application. And then, of course, we would ask you in this instance for uh, a letter stating that you can use this because many times we have applications and uh, Dr. Smith wants to use some data that Dr. Jones collected. Well, the IRB can't give you permission to do that unless Dr. Jones has said, absolutely, I'll share my data with you. So we always look for that letter from the source of the data giving uh, the individual permission to do or complete the secondary data analysis. And then, of course, again, as we said earlier, that if the data are de-identified, we want um, a letter saying that um, the holder of that key that links the specimen or the data to the research participant will not be provided to um, the uh, individual completing the secondary data analysis. Exempt is the next lowest risk of um, research that we review at the UAB IRB. And under the federal regulations, certain categories of activity that are considered research can be declared exempt from further review. So basically what this means is that it is not exempt from initial review, but it's exempt from further review. So if you have an exempt application or have an exempt approval, it means that we will never see you again with this study unless, of course, um, the study changes, there are amendments or revisions to the study in which you would, it would change the level of review. So what is eligible for exempt? So research that involves little to no risk. So if you're doing exempt research, you should be able to publish the findings um, in the newspaper and it would not cause any harm to any individual's reputation, their financial uh, status, their employability, their reputation, etc. And of course, the determination is made by the IRB, not the researcher. So we do ask that you submit that exempt application. Okay, so what's not eligible for exempt? That would be research that involves any associated risk. And some research with vulnerable populations are not eligible for exempt under the federal guidelines. You cannot survey or interview children in exempt research. And then um, observation of the public behavior of children when the investigators interact with the children is not, is not permissible under exempt research. And then, of course, research involving prisoners. Because of all of the previous uh, research history using prisoners, um, all prisoner research, any prisoner research at UAB must be reviewed by the full convened board. And then, of course, uh, uh, any FDA-regulated 
um, research cannot be reviewed through the exempt process, with the exception of, of taste and food quality studies. And again, the determination is made by the IRB, not the investigator. So there are uh, categories of exempt, and these are all on the applications. So if you go to the IRB website, you'll see that um, the description of the various categories uh, defined by the federal regulations in exempt research uh, are on our form. So the first category uh, is exempt category one, and this would be normal educational practices and settings. So this would be maybe um, you are you are you are looking at a uh, maybe a, a project where you have a classroom and and you are um, trying a new survey type of, of research or a new classroom strategy. So this would be normal educational practices and settings. So in this uh, exempt category one, you would justify how you're using a commonly accepted educational setting or how the educational practices are different. The uh, FERPA and PPRA may apply, so uh, we have to make certain that we adhere to these guidelines also. And of course, exempt, you cannot, cannot, cannot involve sensitive topics such as sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So again, exempt, as I said earlier, you should be able to publish the findings from your study in the newspaper because there are little or no risk involved to any research participant. Okay, and then of course you cannot involve recorded observations when it is not part of the uh, regular classroom curriculum. Exempt category two, this would be anonymous educational tests, surveys, interviews, or observation of public behavior. We see a lot of uh, interview research uh, through exempt category two here at UAB, uh, researching residents on, on their um, thoughts about their clinical rotations, uh, re um, surveying nurses on, on um, what their thoughts are on a particular nursing procedure. So exempt category two does not apply um, if the information is recorded in such a manner that human subjects can be identified and that disclosure of their responses outside the research could place the subject at risk of criminal or civil liability or be damaging to their financial standing, employability, or reputation. So again, both of these, it has to be identifiable and damaging uh, for SM category two not to apply. Most totally anonymous surveys, uh, if you can convince the IRB that your survey is anonymous, maybe using SurveyMonkey, uh, maybe using Qualtrics. UAB, by the way, has a, a contract with Qualtrics, so we do recommend Qualtrics if you're doing any type of uh, um, online survey. And if you can tell us how this is totally anonymous, then uh, most of the time survey research is exempt. Exempt category three, I've never seen this at UAB. This is mainly for uh, elected prof um, officials. So we actually hold them to a higher standard than we do um, other research participants. So this is uh, any type of educational test using survey procedures, interview procedures, or observations from elected or public officials. Um, we see a lot of exempt category four. This is collection or study of existing data. The key word here is that all data must be pre-existing. So for instance, if you submit your IRB application on January 15th, 2015, then all of the data should be existing uh, prior to January 15th, 2015. So this has to be pre-existing documents. Uh, records, pathological specimens, diagnostic spe specimens, and it, um, they also have to be recorded in such a manner that the research participants cannot be identified through any direct identifiers, which are those 18 hip identifiers, or any indirect identifiers, which would be um, identifiers which we talked about earlier, such as age, ethnic group, sex, uh, et cetera. 
Okay. And we, again, we see a lot of exempt category four here, especially for uh, chart reviews. But again, if you're doing a chart review and you're collecting elements of date, date of drug initiation, date of surgery, date of admission, discharge, um, it will probably not qualify for um, exempt review. There are some situations now where we are allowing limited data sets to be reviewed as an exempt review, but this would be in, in, a, in a special circumstance. Exempt category five, we rarely see this here at UAB. This would be research and demonstration projects that are funded by federal monies. Um, and uh, it's an examination of services under those programs, such as Medicaid, un unemployment, maybe Social Security. Exempt category six, I have never seen here at UAB. These are taste and food evaluation acceptance studies, even though our, our director, who's been here almost about three years now, uh, came from Mississippi State, and he said they did a ton of exempt category six taste and food evaluation studies at Mississippi State. So um, each university has their own focus. So why would you want to submit an exempt application? One, it doesn't require an annual review. So we talked about earlier that you had to submit the investigator's progress report on an annual, um, quarterly, or biannual basis, depending on the risk of your study. So for an exempt application, again, we'll never see you, we'll never hear from you again, uh, unless there is an amendment to your research that would um, maybe change the level of review. Okay, uh, exempt, we see very few amendments. Most of what we see in exempt research is change in personnel. Um, okay, this has changed. It says it does require submission of a final report. It does not require submission of a final report when complete, uh, but it does require current RB training. So if you are an investigator on an exempt project, you, we will require you to have IRB training. And you, when you submit your initial application, you uh, would be required to submit the protocol oversight review form. Now, the next uh, level of review is expedited. To submit an expedited application at the UAB IRB, you would submit form 200. There are two general categories that can qualify. Uh, research activities that present no more than minimal risk, and um, we'll talk about these uh, a little later, and then minor changes in previously approved research during the period um, of a year. So many times, um, if it's a full board protocol, minor changes such as personnel changes are approved through the expedited process. Now, what is minimal risk? So again, to fit in the expedited category, it has to meet one of the um, um, categories that is defined by the DHHS regulations. And DHSS and FDA define minimal risk as the probability and magnitude of harm or discomfort anticipated in research are not greater in and of themselves than those ordinarily encountered in the daily life or during performance of routine physical or psychological exams or tests. So this is the regulatory definition of minimal risk. And we'll talk about the categories and how these uh, meet this minimal risk definition. The expedited uh, protocols do require annual review, so we would expect that um, uh, investigators progress report on a yearly basis for the expedited protocols. Expedited category one um, is clinical studies of drugs and medical devices. I have never seen an expedited category one at this university. There, and remember, medical devices could be things like uh, class one medical devices or uh, spectacles or uh, Band-aids, tampons, so there are all sorts of medical devices, but it's, uh, it, it, you're really hard pressed to find one a study that would fit into uh, expedited category one. Expedited category two is collection of blood samples by finger, heel, or ear stick, or by venipuncture. Again, this fits the definition of minimal risk. Um, there are two stipulations to expedited category two. 
from healthy non-pregnant adults they must weigh 110 pounds and the amount drawn may not exceed 550 mils in an eight-week period and collection cannot occur more frequently than two times per week. So if you are submitting an expedited category two protocol, then we would want to see in the inclusion criteria that your um, participants must be non, uh, cannot be pregnant and they must weigh at least 110 pounds because this, these are the regulations. So we will ask you if we received your expedited application and your inclusion criteria does not specifically state that um, that the individual must weigh 110 pounds and the exclusion criteria um, pregnancy would have to be um, an exclusion criteria also. Now from other adults and children, these are for individuals who may be um, ill, then there are regulations that apply to them also. Now I will point out that Children's December 1, 2014, uh, Children's Hospital, um, there were some new guidelines for blood draws and research. And so those are what you should adhere to, not the, um, the federal rec regulated, the uh, definition as defined by the federal regulations. From other adults and children, considering the age, weight, health, and the collection procedure, the amount drawn may not exceed the lesser of 50 mils are three mils per kilogram in an eight week period and collection may not occur more frequently than two times per week. So for expedited category two, both of these, if you're drawing from healthy individuals, part one would apply. If you're drawing from other adults and children, part two would apply. And then of course, if, um, if you're drawing from, uh, ch from pediatrics, then uh, we would go by the Children's of Alabama guidelines. Expedited category three would be prospective collection of biological specimens by non-invasive means. We often see this category with another category. They're, collect they're collecting sputum, they're collecting urine, they're collecting the placenta after it has been removed at delivery, um, saliva. Um, so most of the time these are not useful unless you have data from the medical records. So we also, we often see category three with um, a category five, which would be a medical record uh, review. And again, these are minimal risks because they're non-invasive procedures. So if you're collecting urine, but you're doing it via catheterization, then that would not qualify for expedited review because that is um, invasive. If you are, uh, go beyond the, the uh, nasal oz, the rectal oz, then that is not expeditable because that it becomes invasive. If you go beyond the, um, the cervix, then that is not um, expeditable because it does become invasive. Expedited category four is collection of data through non-invasive means routinely employed in clinical practice. We see a lot of exercise studies uh, that fall into category four. Um, these would be things like physical sensors applied to the surface of the body, like for e EKGs, EEGs, uh, weighing or testing, uh, sensory acuity, MRIs, ultrasounds. And note that for expedited category four, if you're doing an exercise study, it has to be only moderate exercise. Now, the definition of that varies. So if you're doing an exercise study um, in healthy, trained athletes, then moderate exercise to them would be probably a higher level than if you're doing uh, ex an exercise intervention with an 80 year old. So again, it depends on the population, it depends on um, their, physical, um, their physical abilities as far as whether it is truly moderate exercise. And of course, uh, this does require full written consent. Please note that anything that involves x-rays, meaning CAT scans, um, any type of um, maybe a PET scan, uh, these will, are not expeditable and they require convened board review. 
expedited category five, we see a lot of that here at UAB, chart reviews, chart reviews. Many students do chart reviews um, for their either dissertation as part of their um, research requirements for, for uh, their curriculum, okay? And this is all doing, uh, all being done usually on um, the, from information gleaned from the medical record, okay? Okay, remember though, if you were um, doing a chart review on children, we have to establish that risk level to children and, that, and you would have to submit that special populations review form for children that is found at the IRB website. Expedited category six is collection of data from voice, video, digital, or image recordings. Again, these are minimal risk. Um, and if you are audio videoing a person, you making any type of recording, that should be clearly spelled out in the consent document. And also, you should tell that participant what you're doing with the um, with with the, t the tape or the recording at the end. So how are you going to destroy it? What's the final disposition? These are the questions that we would also ask you at the IRB because we want to make sure these don't show up on YouTube somewhere. And that should also be in the consent document. Expedited category seven, we also see a lot of. Again, this is minimal risk. Research on individual or group characteristics or research involving survey, interview, or focus groups uh, our program evaluations. Um, as, as we talked about earlier, are exempt. Most of these are exempt, but unless the uh, topics tend to be more sensitive in nature, in nature, if they are more sensitive, then we would ask that you submit an expedited application. So if you're still unsure about what application, what category your um, research fits into. There are some decision trees, and I have the, um, the link to that here. And then there's also some um, um, FAQs on exemptions, and both of those resources are here. Now, the highest level review at the IRB is the full convene board review. So any research that is not eligible un under either not humans, exempt, are expedited <clears throat> is reviewed by the IRB board at a convened meeting. And again, we talked about these meetings are held on a weekly basis every Wednesday. And in general, these projects will involve more risk, vulnerable populations such as uh, children, uh, pregnant women, uh, prisoners. Uh, invasive procedures or interviews that are not minimal risk, drugs, devices, clinical or experimental interventions or procedures. And of course, once the protocol is reviewed by the convened board, it has to be voted on. So the majority of the members at the meeting would have to vote to approve it. Okay, here at the UAB IRB, um, generally what we see is that protocols are either approved, approved with limited modifications, uh, deferred for response or totally deferred. And you can go to our website and find the um, complete definition of these. But basically, if a protocol is approved with limited modifications, that means that they're just minor questions that the board has. For instance, this week I had one that the um, board wanted to know what kind of blood um, tests were being measured at week six. So this would be approved with limited modifications. Um, the, the protocol was fine otherwise, but there were just minor questions that they had. If a protocol is deferred for response, it means that there are still some major issues with the protocol and that the board wants to see it again, and they want to see your response to their questions. So you receive a letter back from the board once your protocol has been reviewed by the board, and uh, the board for a deferred for response protocol, then uh, the board would want to see your response before it could be approved. And if your protocol is totally deferred, it means you just have to start over because it, there wasn't enough information there for the board to uh, determine the safety um, of the protocol. Okay, so IRBs have the authority to approve uh, required modifications in human subjects research, disapprove, or suspend or terminate approval in human subjects research under their purview. 
And at a minimum, IRBs must require that the information provided to the subject as part of the informed consent contain the required elements. And then IRBs shall conduct continuing review of research at inter intervals appropriate to the degree of risk, but not less than one year. And then always the IRB has the authority to come in and review the uh, consent process. And as you'll find out, if you have not attended the uh, lecture on consent process, consent is uh, crucial, and consent is an ongoing process. It's not just handing the participant the consent form and asking them to read it, okay? And of course, uh, as we said earlier, all research is not approvable. Now, according to the uh, Code of Federal Regulations, and all of you, I'm sure, are well aware of what the Code of Regulations are, um, the most important part of this is in reviewing a, a full board protocol is a Code of Federal Regulations Part 46.111. So straight from code, uh, the Code of Federal Regulations, it tells us that the IRB board must make certain that the risk to the subjects are minimized, the risk to the subjects are reasonable in relation to the anticipated benefits, if any, to the subjects, and the importance of the knowledge that could be reasonably expected to result. Selection of subjects is equitable. Now, this is important because we know from uh, prior history that certain ethnic groups um, were misused and abused in research. And we want to make sure that research that takes place here at UAB is equitable, that the findings of this research, um, if they can benefit all ethnic groups, then um, the selection of the research participants should reflect um, equitability among all ethnic groups. And we will also make certain that the appropriate informed consent is sought from the individual and that informed consent should be appropriately documented um, via the informed consent document. The next thing we must ascertain is that the research plan makes adequate provision for monitoring the data collected to ensure the safety of participants. So how often are you going to um, look at that data. If you have an investigator initiated study where you are administering, uh, say, a, um, a drug that is approved for another purpose, then how often are you looking at that data to make certain that those patients are being kept safe? So this is something that the board will want to know in your application. Is there a data safety monitoring board? Who's on that monitoring board? Who's going to be looking at this? How often are you going to be looking at the data? And we want to know that there are adequate provisions to protect the privacy of the subjects and to maintain confidentiality of the data. We want to know where you're storing those documents, how you're storing them. Are you storing them hard copy? Uh, if you're storing them hard copy, is identifiable information uh, kept behind closed doors, locked doors, behind uh, in locked cabinets? Um, if you're um, storing it electronically, who has access to that computer? Is it behind a locked door? Is it password protected? So these are all the, this is all the information that you must include in the HSP to make certain that the IRB has enough information to meet the federal guidelines of um, what is actually approvable in research. The board also, uh, according to 46.116, must look that, make certain that the vulnerable populations are protected. We have special population review forms at our website to make certain that fetuses are protected, that pregnant women are, are protected, that neonates are protected, that uh, children are protected, that prisoners are protected. So if there are any vulnerable population um, we will want to make certain that those people are protected. We want to make certain that if you are, uh, for instance, doing blood draw in children and um, that an economically disadvantaged population is not going to bring their child up here to have their child's blood drawn just to benefit financially from your study. So again, we'd want to make sure that the payment is not coercive so that you are not taking the PI or the study is not taking advantage of people who may be mentally, economically, or educationally disadvantaged. Uh, we have policies, procedures, 
related to enrolling people who may be who have um, learning disabilities, intellectual disabilities in research studies. So again, it's the responsibility of the board to make certain that any vulnerable population is protected. Other things that we look at uh, at a full board convened meeting is uh, the language level of the consent document. So as you know, the consent document must be written at an eighth grade or lower language. And again, depending on uh, your population, if you have individuals who may have learning disabilities or who are intellectually disabled, it would have to be even at a lower level. There may be other types of um, tools that you would use to obtain consent from from people who would not understand the eighth grade language. Maybe you need to do a PowerPoint, maybe you need to do a flip chart. Um, so you have to make certain that the individual has the, the consent capacity to understand what they are agreeing to in your research. Uh, the language level of the consent document should be free of jargon and understandable by the general population. Liter literacy should not be presumed. We have studies where investigators actually submit um, questionnaires where they will ask the participant, what was your understanding of um, voluntary participation? What are the... Uh, research procedures that will be done in this protocol. So it's your job as an investigator to make certain that the participant uh, understands what they are agreeing to. So again, the language and the consent should be attained in a language understandable to the subject. So if you have a participant who does not speak English, you cannot use that English consent to, cons to consent them. It has to be uh, the regulations state that the consent document should be in a language that the participant understands. So if you have a participant who only speaks Spanish, then the IRB is going to be looking for that uh, Spanish uh, consent document. We, the IRB also looks at the stipend amount. We want to make sure that um, what you're paying these uh, research participants is not coercive. For instance, we talked about earlier the uh, blood draw in children. Are you paying $100 per blood draw? That would be coercive. So again, the stipends, um, uh, stipends that may be too high can make the study too appealing to the economically disadvantaged. And um, the IRBs always approve uh, based on what is equitable, not on the risk. So we're not going to uh, approve a study where they're paying an individual thousands of dollars because it's a high-risk study. And again, if there's any financial conflict of interest, this has to be um, disclosed in the consent document. For instance, we have a lot of small businesses that um, that uh, collaborate with UAB investigators because they're inventing maybe a new wheelchair or a new device that could help people who um, are disabled. So they could potentially benefit from that. So that has to be disclosed in the consent document. So these are um, considerations that the IRB board must consider and approve before the research is approvable. I won't go too much into the elements of informed consent because uh, there is another um, lecture on that, but basically this is from 46.116, uh, straight from the uh, Code of Federal Regulations. These eight elements uh, listed here are the elements that are required in a consent document. So anytime you submit a consent document to the IRB, we are going to look for these eight elements. Uh, if you're using an information sheet rather than a consent document, we will look for these eight elements in your uh, information sheet. Um, we want to see that there's a statement that the study involves research uh, and an explanation of the procedures. We want to see the description of all foreseeable risk. If you are doing a drug study and there are risks in the uh, investigator's brochure, we want to see those in the consent document. Uh, any description of any benefits, disclosure of appropriate Alternate, alternate procedures or procedures or courses of treatment that might be advantageous to the subject. A statement describing the extent to which confidentiality of records identifying the subject will be maintained. 
and um, if it's greater than minimal risk, an explanation as to whether any compensation, medical treatments are available if surgery, if injury occurs, and a question section, and then most importantly, a statement that participation is voluntary. So these eight elements are the required elements that must be in any consent document, whether it's an information sheet um, or a formal consent document. Okay. So there are other elements of informed consent that are from 46.116 um, that, when appropriate, are included. And um, this would be unforeseeable risk when the participant's um, participation may be terminated, any additional cost to the subject. So is the subject going to have to pay for parking? If you're doing a study where they're required to use their cell phone or their internet, are they having data usage charges or cell phone charges? Or um, And what happens if they withdraw? Are they going to have to come back and uh, complete all the study visits, even though they may not be participating in the study intervention? Do they have to have um, uh, a study visit follow-up? And, um, and then a statement that says that we will notify you if any findings uh, would affect your future participation, and then also the approximate number of subjects. So if you use a sample consent form found at the IRB website, that if you go by that, that has all of the um, the elements of consent that are required, and it's best just to tailor that to um, what you're doing in your research. Let's talk about assent and children briefly. Uh, I think that the consent uh, lecture will go over this in full, but but assent is a child's affirmative agreement to participate in research. They're passive. Oh, okay, that is not assent. Okay. Um, so never consider a uh, passive, passive resignation as their assent. They must say, yes, I do agree to participate in this research. Um, and UAP policy is that assent should be obtained if the child is, is developmentally able, um, psychologically able to provide assent for 7 to 13 year olds and the consent of at least one parent, depending on the risk of the study. A separate assent form is required for children 7 to 13 years of age, and the sample can be found at the IRB website. Children 14 to uh, 18 can sign the adult's consent form, and if you look at the sample consent form found at the IRB website, uh, there is a signature page for uh, research involving children, so just follow that. There's a sample asset form at the IRB website. So children 7 to 13 must file, must sign a separate asset form for their participation in the research. And of course that is written at a much lower level um, than the 8th grade uh, literacy. Um, and then of course depending on the age, maturity, or psychological state, state of the child, assent is waived. So for instance, many, most of the time we see assent being waived for the younger child, two or three years old. Uh, but if a child is capable of understanding, and then even the five and six year old, uh, you should include them in on the, on the consent um, process. And always, with any research involving children, we do require that special population review form for children. And that cute child there is my grandson. And I do have his parents' uh, informed consent to use his photograph. We have waivers at the IRB. There are um, three main waivers. Waiver of consent, everybody always most people do not understand the difference between these waivers. Waiver of consent, meaning no consent of any, t any type or any kind. An example of this would be, for instance, um, we have a lot of minor mothers here. And the minor mother probably doesn't live with her parents. She's 16, 17, 18 years old because the age of majority in Alabama is 19. So this 16, 17, 18 year old who just delivered a baby um, has been approached to be in a research study, but her mother is not available. So 
in this instance, the IRB, we must probably waive consent of the minor mother's uh, parents because she is maybe emancipated. She uh, may not live with her parents. Uh, um, so these are the instances when we see waiver of consent. We see a lot of student research here where uh, the IRB waives parental consent because the student doesn't live at home, they're away, away at college, the parent's not available, they work. So um, it depends on the risk involved of the study, whether the IRB will waive parental consent for uh, a minor child anyone under 19. Waiver of authorization and informed consent, we see this mostly with chart reviews. Um, and it can be used if you're only requesting a HIPAA waiver. So um, you would just complete questions one through four in that instance. Waiver of consent documentation, this is another waiver form that we have. So uh, there are three major waiver, consent waivers. Um, the waiver of consent documentation is, is used when you use an information sheet, maybe for instance in a survey when you're not obtaining written consent. So the waiver of consent documentation simply means that you're not documenting their consent. You are obtaining consent, but maybe you have a cover letter or a cover sheet that is attached to your survey and the survey is so benign that there's very little risk. But um, you would provide that waiver of consent documentation that just says you aren't going to, um, to have the participant sign a consent document. And I thank you very much for your patience and for listening. Um, my favorite quote about research is that if we all knew what we were doing, it would not be called research, would it, from Albert Einstein. Thank you again. It's been a pleasure being with you and wish you all a great day and happy research.